Hello, friends, and welcome. I'm your co-host, Andrew Lazaga, here with Dubside. And you're listening to the Dubcast with Dubside. In our last episode, Dubside, you reported from SK-102 on Lake Anna in Virginia. Yes. In an interview recorded last year. And now you've just returned from this year's SK-102. Yeah. So how was it? Oh, it was good. We had we had a fair amount of rain. It was a different a different kind of weather pattern. It was heavy rain Friday, and then heavy rain Sunday. Mm. So a lot of people just decided, well, I'll, I'll come Saturday morning. I won't come Friday. <laughs> and then and then as the forecast evolved, they said, well, why don't I just leave Saturday night? So they they made it like a one day thing. Maybe maybe half. We had about a hundred people there. So maybe half the people just made it came for one day. Oh, but we, yeah. you know, but the weather was was pretty good on Saturday, so we we did all the, the classes and the usual things, and it, yeah, it went okay. And then then they had a lot of issues with the when they they park on a, a vacant lot and the, it tears up the grass quite a bit. So they actually they wanted to move all the cars off of the lot Saturday night, you know, the, mm. before the bonfire, and they did. It was quite a noble effort. They they moved them down the street. Then they they, they were calling neighbors to say, "Can we use your driveway?" And they they worked through the whole thing. So yeah. They still tore up the some of the, the grass, but they, they they figured they tore it some of it up on Friday, and they figured m- more rain on Sunday is just going to be even worse. Let's get the cars out now so we don't make, make it any worse. So yeah, it, it, they pull it off, man. Yeah, but went okay. I think it's so cool that that lake is warmed by a nuclear power plant. Yeah, I think that would be fun to uh, play in there in the winter. Yeah, yeah. You you don't want to get out of the water. It's warmer <laughs> in the water. Well, the other day, I met someone you know, mm-hmm. John Lockwood, the founder of Pygmy Boats. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I first met him at the, before him and his daughter went to, to Greenland. That was 2015, I think. Okay. They, they, they came to Styx once or twice. And like and he had just built her the, the boat, what he calls it, the Freya, Freya boat or something. Yeah, that, yeah named after her. Her, her special rolling, rolling kayak. And she had it at sticks, and I tried it. I was I was quite impressed because I I'd been in some of the other the other pygmy boats, and yeah, you know, they're not made for rolling, so I, I just didn't really have much regard for them since rolling is mostly what I do. But I got in that thing, I said, "Wow, this thing really rolls." Yeah. It's, it's good as it's good as the the rebel, you know, the John Worston design in some ways. Oh yeah, okay. So, and 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 he he was they were telling me that he had he had made it, you know, the prototype, but it, but he had, he. Had, Messed something up and he wanted to change it. And she said, she said, no, no, don't, don't change it. Whatever you did, that whatever fluke this is, leave it exactly like it is, because this one rolls really well. Hmm. That, that, the design process involved some something of an error that turned out to be a good error, kind of thing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to uh, talk to him in detail about that, but he did mention that he had gone through six versions of that kayak yeah, before right. they settled on this, the final one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, For those who don't know, John Lockwood is the founder of Pygmy Boats, and he designed several models of touring sea kayaks. So so Pygmy are the ones that they're made out of wood, yeah. right? And you glue the wood together. And so the the two big wooden kayak kit manufacturers are Pygmy on the West Coast and Chesapeake Lightcraft on the East Coast. Yep. My first sea kayak was actually a Pygmy. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. I uh, I bought it used. At the West Coast Sea Kayak Symposium, someone was selling it, and uh, mm. and I took that boat all over. I, you know, I uh, used to go camping in the San Juans. Yeah, but the original Pygmy boats were not at all Greenland style boats. They're very modern yeah. design, very roomy, because um, they were made for camping. Yeah, and um, and every time I took that boat around, people say, "Oh, what a beautiful boat! Did you build it yourself?" And um, I had to say no, and that actually inspired me to start building my own kayaks because <laughs> mm-hmm. I was tired of telling people that I didn't build it myself. Yeah. And um, Kai and I built one in uh, 2020 during the first spring of the pandemic, uh, Penguino Pro 150, because... Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this turned out to be one of the most popular or their most popular models. All right. After we finished that, I actually wanted to build another one for myself, but then they had closed down uh. because uh, they were one of the non-essential businesses and they couldn't uh, 
get people into mm-hmm. their shop to uh, buy kayaks anymore. So, and since well, then mm-hmm. they never opened back up for various reasons. I think partly uh, John wanted to retire and also they couldn't find uh, anybody to work there. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. And he put up the business for sale, but couldn't find yeah. anybody to take it. Well, wow. so, yeah. Hmm. Well, that's certainly the end of an era there. Yeah. And weren't you in Greenland when uh, Freya went yeah. to the competition? Yeah, yeah, they were both there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah she did very well. She, she, I, I was looking up yesterday her rolling score. She did two hundred and fifty nine points in rolling. Oh, what wow! A good score. Yeah, yeah. He said that he, she did better than um, the men in the men's category. Yeah, there was a Swedish guy there, uh, Mats, who'd been there once before. I think he had 244. <laughs> so oh, uh-huh. she beat him. Yeah. Well, he told me, he said, everything that people believe about designing rolling kayaks is wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, we didn't have a lot of time to chat, but um, he said that a flat deck makes it harder to roll because uh, it's the shape of the deck when it's underwater that is the key to making the kayak easy to roll. Yeah. Yeah. The flat deck oh, just uh, sits on the top of the water. That's one of the keys, I would say. But, yeah. But yeah. But uh, I would I would agree with that. I mean, you, you see, like the, the the John Worston's design, the Rebel kayak, it used to be the Thai Greenland, has that you know the, the the front deck, it's got a lot of space for your knees and it's sort of peaked up. It's not as, as flat and low as some of the skin on frame Greenland is Well, I would I wish I had a chance to talk to him longer about it. Anyway. Yeah. The success of the Freya is. Uh, Proof, I think he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I invited him to be on the podcast, but got the impression he um, was not too interested. He's probably mm-hmm. off uh, traveling the world somewhere. Yeah. Anyway, that's my story. All right. So, without further ado, here's Dubcast number 42. Welcome to the Dubcast with Dubside. This is Dubcast 42. I'll tell you about my first few times in Sweden. And I'll tell you about things I did on the land, in the water, and in the air. And I have a big name to mention. Well, you, you can judge for yourself how big the name is. You know, I, I've mentioned on this podcast, let's see, I've talked about George Clooney in passing. I've said the name Bruce Springsteen. I've said the name um, Henry David Thoreau from the past. And I've said the name Muhammad Ali. Well, I have a name to give you. And this, this, this name is not someone I mentioned in in passing or reference to. This is a name I actually had personal interactions with. So uh, be prepared for that. And I've got some music from a group called Thornstone. And a bit of interesting uh, twist on the musical segment. So in 2006, I had put out this DVD called Greenland Rolling with Dubside, and it was selling, and there was a place in Sweden that uh, kept reordering it. They were selling a lot of them, a place called the Escape Kayak Center in Gothenburg. And so by 2007, they invited me to go there, which I did. And I have mentioned Sarah Wagner in some past dubcasts. Her husband was Johan at the time, and they had a daughter when I first went who was about maybe one year or less of age named Elda. And besides teaching there at uh, the their place in Gothenburg, we did a little tour, a couple other cities we went to and did some demonstration, rolling, rolling demonstrations and instruction to go with it. And back then, this is 2007, the Atahi Marine Greenland Kayak, which became the extremely popular Greenland Rolling Kayak, did 
was not on the market at this point, had not been fully developed yet. So I had brought my Feathercraft Whisper. I had tricked that one out to do my hardest rolls in. But uh, otherwise, I would usually get a uh, the Nigel Dennis Romany rolled fairly well. And um, I like the, there was a Romany low volume back then. This is actually before, before Nigel Dennis kayaks went to those knee bubbles, which if you have, I guess, average size legs help you to get your knees in position. But I, I, I'm a small guy, so I, I liked it without the knee bubbles. Well, Escape Kayak Center was a dealer for Nigel Dennis kayaks. And I believe they also had rock pool kayaks, which were big back then. Uh, the Escape Kayak Center physical facility was an old warehouse that had been a, a, a boat repair place where the, the rails coming from the water right up into the, into the doors that would slide open. And they had put in racks for kayaks and there were lots of little cubby hole areas and separate rooms in the back and things. It was kind of kind of run down, dilapidated. And the, uh, since it was being rented, the, the uh, escape center didn't want to put any money into the building because they wouldn't have got anything back on the investment. So it's kind of always sort of in the process of falling apart. And in the back inner reaches of the building, they had a few interesting artifacts, you could say. On one wall, there was a kayak, and it was clearly a Nigel Dennis Romany, a rather old-looking Romany. Uh, so this is, you know, no knee bubbles at all. And I was told, I, I don't know if it even had the Romany letters ring on the side, but you could tell by the shape. I, I was told that this was the first Romany out of the mold, a uh, real collector's item, I suppose. I imagine somewhere else somebody thinks they have the first ever prototype, but may, maybe this was the first production one, but that's, that's all academic. It was a very early Romany. And it's interesting to note that they, the, the exact position of where you put the, the skeg control and whether you have the, like the skeg with a, with a cable or a, a cord, with various attempts to get the ideal rudder situation, and none of them have, have proved to be the, the best way to do it. And there's different ideas of a built-in pump. And, of course, the seat and the deck lines have all evolved over time, but... This, this one was supposed to be the first one out of the mold, the first production Romany ever done. So the city of Gothenburg, the center of the city where all the tall buildings are, is sort of in and up a river a ways, but the, the outskirts of, of Gothenburg lie more out on the coast, which it's protected by quite, a, quite an extensive archipelago from the, the actual open sea. But um, I did at one point, since I had my Feathercraft there, do a little of my uh, public transportation kayaking, and I took a bus into town, and there, I, maybe I paddled in from, from the center, um, had the, the along the shoreline and in and up the river, and got into the center of town and got on a bus, I took a bus trolley train, a couple, whatever combination it was, and came all the way back. But, but mostly I was I was teaching with uh, from the center there, and there's a very nice set of islands you can go out and around and find a spot to stand in the water with a group of students. Sarah Wagner had a brother, still has a brother, named Simon. And Simon was a balloon pilot. He had the license and certification to take passengers up in a hot air balloon. And this is actually a rather expensive thing to do as a as a paying customer because um, a balloon is an expensive thing to operate and so it, it's not cheap to take a ride in a hot air balloon but since I had the family connection there he uh, had some people going out and offered to let me ride for free which I did it's quite fascinating to watch the whole uh, operation of the inflating a hot air balloon they have a, a big trailer that they um, hitch to a car to take it out on site and then it takes quite a while to uh, unfold it and lay it all out and then start putting the hot air in on one edge. And somebody's got to go inside, take off their shoes and carefully walk in there to, to push, you know, open up the so the hot air can flow in there. And then it, uh, eventually over 
a, quite a period of, of minutes. Uh, it starts to, to get inf inflating and come up, and then it finally takes takes up and pulls straight up into the air and holds up the, the gondola. And I learned that uh, balloon pilots have to pay very close attention to the weather. Because the balloons, you know, you can't really steer them um, with any precision. And you have to sort of go where the wind takes you. And the thing to be avoided at all costs is getting blown out over water and not being able to come back. So they're paying uh, special attention to the weather patterns and wind direction. And I'm told that the certification and safety uh, procedures for a balloon are such that if, if the balloon accidentally goes out over water and, and goes in, and I suppose they, that the chase car can summon a boat to go rescue the people, but if the, the balloon itself gets wet, um, it's, it's a lost, lost cause because it, they, you, you cannot uh, uh, maintain certification with a balloon that has gotten water. You have to toss that, that much away. I suppose you can save the gondola, but the, the balloon itself, the, whatever, thousands of dollars of that cost is, is uh, for loss. Well, ri riding in the balloon up in the air, is you, because obviously it's an amazing sight to see all the things going by and silently, except for when they fire up the, the uh, jets for the hot air, but other, they turn them off and it's just a quiet ride and you're going over neighborhoods and farmlands and stuff. And the, the, he had another guy with a second balloon. So there was two, of, two balloons out there, you know, like four or five of us in, in ours, and I think maybe six or seven. The other one was a slightly larger gondola, and larger balloon. And what they, the, the pilots challenge each other. Um, they, they'll come down low, and then you're going over farmlands and things, and they try to just skim the, you know, the crops, the edges of the grass or whatever it is, just with the bottom of the of the gondola, and then come back up, which is tricky to do because you you, can, you don't have a direct, immediate correlation between firing up the hot air and just coming down low. Yet there's a bit of a delay there, so it takes quite a bit of skill to do that accurately. Uh, and if you mess up and hit the ground, the whole thing's going to tip over if you're going in a horizontally quickly. So, but they, they, these these guys, both Simon and the other guy, could were able to do that. They would come down low and then skim the grass and go back up again. So when, when it's time to, to, to land, uh, they, they find a, a decent spot. And there's a car that's been chasing them, you know, trying to negotiate through the back rows to clo stay close to where they are. So to, to, to put the balloon away is a big, huge operation as it was to, to get it up there. So you have to slowly let the air out and then carefully fold up the, the whole blown balloon and get it back into the trailer. And it requires a good deal of help. You just need lots of hands to, to do all that work. And so we all we all chipped in, the, you know, part of the deal, and, and in that half hour or so of the process, got the balloon all packed away. And then they had a, a ceremony um, where they they gave us all like I have a little diploma that says I'm officially you know been in a balloon. And they told us that um, if you the amount of work that it takes to put a balloon away is is quite substantial. So anybody who's been in a balloon is expected to, if, they, if they're just in their travels, come across a balloon that, that's, that's just landed and is being put away, they're obligated to help out in the process. Um, and I'm told that if you don't help, and if the people with the balloon find out that you have been in a balloon, then you have to pay for the bottle of champagne. <laughs> so you are... You were warned you must always help a balloon. So if ever I see a balloon landing somewhere, I will step forward and offer my assistance. All right, so now we come to the big name, as it were. We were traveling around Sweden, and there was a kayak, uh, kayak gathering, you know, one of these weekend gathering things that we, we were planning on going to. And I, I was not on the schedule there. The, the uh, Sarah and Johan Wagner just brought me there because they, they usually went to that one every, every year. But I hadn't, they hadn't arranged to put me on the program. Um, so I got there, and it turns out that they did have on the program Freya Hofmeister. And so the day I got there, I think she had, 
she was there was a camping area and there was a the kayak shop and then farther out along out to, to where the, the main shore was it's kind of a sprawling compound there there was a, a trail you went down and maybe a quarter mile down the trail there was a, another an open area with deeper water um, and then she was doing the demonstration a rolling demonstration there so I walked down the trail and went out there I hadn't even put up you know put up the, the tent and the other things I was going to be staying with but um, wanted to see the demonstration so I got out there um, now let me let me back up a little bit and tell you that a rolling demonstration can be thought of as a lesson or as a show you can try to teach an audience details about the different techniques or you can entertain and amaze them coming as I do from a background as a live sound engineer I am more oriented towards the show business angle. Typical pace of a rolling demonstration would start with the easy rolls and end with the hardest ones. So rolling etiquette would frown on someone who's not in the demonstration, knocking out straitjacket rolls in sight of the audience before the show was slated to begin. That's also the type of behavior that a real Greenland seal hunter would never engage in. Despite the fact that in this country, so many of us are show-offs at heart. Nevertheless, I try to be mindful of remaining in the background when someone else is the featured star of the show. It's not just rolling etiquette, it is show business etiquette. So I, got, I get out, back in Sweden here, I get out to where, to where the, there's a group of people, an audience on the water, and there's Freya there, and not wanting to, you know, upstage anyone. It's her show. She's, she's on, she's billed as the as a feature there. So I, I sort of s- s- snuck to the back of the crowd and just sat down. And so it's, it's, it's time for her to go. And she, the first thing out of her mouth is, is my black brother here? Where is my black brother? Dubside, Dubside, where is Dubside? And, and I'm still trying to hide. And she, says, she sees me, Dubside, Dubside. She comes over and she insisted that I take part in the rolling demonstration with her. And all my protests of like, you know, I'm, I'm not dressed for this. And my, I don't have my kayaks up. And, but she wouldn't hear any of it. She I mean, there's a kayak there you can use. Go back right now. Go now. Go get dressed. Go right now. And then she <laughs> had the audience waiting. Well, it took, the, I don't know, 15 minutes for me to run back to where my stuff was and get changed and come back. But she, she insisted that I do the rolling demonstration with her. So we did. <laughs> Even though it was supposed to be her show, but very generous on her part. Well, going to the Gothenburg and the Escape Kayak Center became a regular annual stop for me. And a few years into that, I was going to be there. I had a weekend without anything lined up. And then I was going to be off to Greenland. And uh, Sarah had hooked up a place inland a bit, um, a couple hours away, that I could do some instruction. They wanted me to come and do a demonstration and some classes. And I, I just wasn't sure about this one. You know, back in episode 39, I had the list of things that can go wrong at a symposium. And so these these last-minute impromptu ones, the chances are higher that it's not going to be a very well-organized arrangement. So figure that I'm in a foreign country, and I do not carry a cell phone, and I'm supposed to take a couple hours of a train ride in the middle of Sweden somewhere to some lake, people I've never met before and teach kayaking and I wasn't so sure about it but uh, I got there and I was quite happily surprised it's just a beautiful place beautiful people and I've been going back there ever since my, it's like my my Swedish family of uh, this uh, Petrus is the guy's name Petrus and Irene is his wife and they have this place called Petrus Kayak. It's in Tranos, in the, sort of the middle of southern Sweden on a, on a big lake. And uh, I've, I've had a great time going there. They, they put me up in their house 
and they've got a, a spot right on the water on the lake and they rent kayaks and canoes and sailboats and motorboats and things and uh, it's a wonderful time I always have there. I usually try to stay for a, maybe a week you know they'll have classes maybe the Friday, Saturday, Sunday if they if they fill up that much. It's, it's an it's a peculiar place because it's not it's not the you know, like a, a mainstream center of big time sea kayaking. It's it's a it's a lake a, a beautiful lake, but there there's no you know high performance you know surf kind of stuff going on there, so it can be sometimes difficult to fill up the classes, but uh, they're they're happy to just break even because we I enjoy seeing them and they enjoy seeing me, and so I've had some some very interesting students there. I'll they'll, I'll usually do a demonstration on say one the, the, maybe the Saturday afternoon. And they'll have somebody will bring a little PA system and they'll do a narration from the land. And we'll, we'll get a crowd there. And the, the local newspaper will have a feature on the, this Greenland-style rolling. And so some of my more unique students I've had there I had a guy. So, you know, so I, I, I'll be preparing for the next day. And I'll say, who are the students here? And they'll have, you've got these five people in the morning and you've got these four people in the afternoon. And I'll try to arrange them, you know, beginners and intermediates. And, but every so often you get things that sort of raise your eyebrows. So I said, well, there's a guy coming um, tomorrow afternoon and he's got no legs and no hands. And I'm thinking, and he's, he's kayaking? Uh, uh, how does that work? I mean, I, you know, without legs you can certainly kayak, but I, you kind of need hands to work the paddle. But I don't know. So, that afternoon comes, and there is a guy, and he had, like, I think he had yeah, one one leg was above the knee, the other one below the knee, or something like that. But yeah, the, as far as the hands go, he had one hand, really no fingers, just kind of a, a bit of a palm, and the other hand, he he sort of had a thumb and maybe part of a finger on it. Um, and I could tell this guy, th- this was clearly somebody who had been. Born, you know, totally able-bodied, and it looked like probably a, probably a, you know, military thing, you know, blown up, blown up by a, an explosive or something like that. Because this guy was a tough dude. I mean, he just like had that that attitude, like I'm going to do what I want to do, and no one's going to stop me. And if I want to kayak, I'm going to kayak. You know, just that's it. And he had he had a, a he he had something of a role. He wanted it tuned up a bit, and he had a. It's, I think it was more of a. I would call it more of a whitewater kayak, or maybe it was just yeah, it was a Euro paddle, and he it was a specially made paddle. So one, he could sort of get his his thumb and finger around one edge of it, and the other the other side, they had put placed a little peg on it, and he could sort of push his his the his part of a palm against that peg, and so I you know, I wasn't going to suggest why don't you try a Greenland paddle because clearly this guy had had the paddle thing all worked out for for him especially. But uh, so we, we worked on some rolling, you know, it was like some C to C kind of rolls, and just getting his getting his orientation right. And, and I, he made some good progress and got got his roll quite well improved. Um, but I was I was quite impressed with just his his determination and his overcoming whatever obstacles were placed in his way. It's kind of kind of sort of makes me think of the the Greenland style of of not lamenting what you have or used to have. What you don't have, or what you used to have, you know, it's like this is what we have right now, and regardless of what he had, was used to doing, you know, before he'd been injured, this is this is what he had to deal with now, and he was just going to figure out a way to make it work, and he did. Well, there was a family that was good friends with uh, Petrus and Irene, and this was the the Wild family. That was that was their last name, Wild. And the guy's name was Johan and his wife, uh, Luisa. They had three daughters who, in, the, in this, my 10 years or so of going there, watched them grow. But when I would do a rolling demonstration, we had soon worked out a, a, the version of it where the two younger daughters, at the, at the time they were, when they started, they might have been like you know, seven, seven and eight or seven and nine or something like that. And so they would swim out in the water. It was, you know, the summertime, nice warm water in the lake. And they would each one would get on each end of the kayak, and then I would do the roll with with two girls on the kayak, uh, which they, was a good crowd pleaser. But I always 
felt nervous. You know, they, they, they wanted to stay on the kayak because, you know, they're out there in the water and, you know, it's a good thing to hold on to. And, you know, when you have two live human beings holding on to your kayak, you, you don't have full control of the kayak. So as soon as the rolling demonstration is done, I'm trying to get them off my kayak and they're wanting to stay on my kayak. Now, Petrus rents canoes. He's got uh, aluminum canoes. There's probably I don't know, 20 or so there. Um, and then he's got many, many kayaks and rowboats and things. And so it's quite weather dependent that rain can come through and it makes for not a great business day, but then you get a good sunny day and lots of people come out. I found it amusing that uh, they, they call a canoe a Canadian. That's, that's what they say. So, you know, there's a, some Germans are coming in. They want to rent six Canadians for the weekend. That's, that, that you'd hear that said. This being Sweden, the lake would freeze over in the wintertime. So kayak rentals was a seasonal activity. Both Petrus and Irene had other occupations they would pursue during the uh, colder times of year. But uh, during the summer... They stayed quite busy. And Petrus would take, uh, get calls for canoes that they would want to rent them at some other portion of the lake. It was a very big lake. Um, and it would, a group would be paddling them for, say, five or six days. And the final spot would be at that uh, his place there, so a, a one-way canoe rental. And so he would have to take, say, a dozen canoes, a dozen Canadians, as they say, to you know, somewhere, you know, take an hour or two to drive there. And I went to help him one time, but he could take a, a trailer, just a flat trailer with maybe, I think he had some posts in the middle of it, and load that with 10 canoes, stacking them five high. And if there was nobody, if I wasn't at helping, he would do that by himself. Struck me as a rather exhausting way to make one's livelihood. But Petrus was dedicated. Sometimes he would have to try to convince the tourists that they they really didn't want to start where they thought they did because it wasn't a really good spot. And, but they, he couldn't change their mind, so he would take the, the canoes all the way out there, and then they would, they would get ready, and then they'd realize, yeah, he was right. They didn't want to start there. They wanted to start somewhere else, so he'd have to drive the canoes again to a different location. And yes, very tiring work. Well, I've had very good experiences in Sweden. It's a lovely country. Uh, you can always find people speaking English there. Just about everybody speaks English. Uh, it is it is rather expensive. You're, the dollar doesn't go all that far, at least when I've been there. So it's it's not like a third world country where your money is quite strong compared to the local currency. The, everything seems to be expensive in Scandinavia, but that's just part of the deal. I'll have more stories from Sweden in future podcasts, but that'll do it for now. Got music from a group called Thornstone. And I was turned on to Thornstone by Adam Hansen from Asiat in Greenland. And it appears Thornstone, they're, they're in the heavy metal mold. And I, I gather they, they're no, I don't think they're active at them anymore now, but they, they had, had an impact back in, the, in their time. And I, it strikes me as that the head guy was one of these, you know, very talented and respected but he was into other things and you know sort of stopped when he did and didn't want to pursue that particular aspect of his creativity any further now I'm going to say that uh, the the lead singer here um, speaks Greenlandic as well as English but the uh, the relationship between those two languages is uh, unique in this song and I'll I'll explain that after we hear this song. I'll explain the lyrics. The lyrics are a bit, uh, a bit extreme and, and, and hard to make out the full meaning of. But uh, anyway, here's a song. For my version, I stuck with the heavy metal style. <laughs>
I'll read you the first verse and chorus of the lyrics. The song is called Magnum Says, and it goes, You're an underwater assault, a holy army that God favors. Me, I live under my rock. My hand stays gripped to my gun, my gun. Of course, favor I, let me be your contribution. Maybe I am your Moses, your bishop, your gospel in disguise, living proof of mistrust. Now, you can tell me what that means, because I'm a little lost in exactly what he's trying to say there. Well, on the CD notes, it has the lyrics in both English and Greenlandic. But here is the unique twist. He sings this song all in English. Those lyrics I just said, so that's exactly what he meant to say in English. I'm so enamored of the Greenlandic language that I made the song in Greenlandic. Now, in order to use those Greenlandic words, they're a good deal longer. I think I had to double every bar of music to give me more space to fit that many syllables into each measure. And the phrasing took a bit of work to squeeze it in there. And I, I, th- I don't think I even bothered with the second verse. It was too much work. But um, that is the sung- Greenlandic song sung in Greenlandic, even though the original wasn't done in Greenlandic. The guy's name is Kuno Hammond. And his group was called Thornstone. I believe they are not active any longer. And the CD was called Been a Fighter. And I don't think this one is available at uh, AtlanticMusic.gl. I'm not sure if it's in print anywhere anymore, but uh, an interesting piece of work. Coming up in episode 43, I'm working on some interviews and things, but I'm not sure what I'll have ready by then. 
but keep me on your radar.